Vertical pod autoscaler can either set requests and limits for your application or provide you with recommendations for that specific service. To function, the VPA controller needs to have access to Metrics API. In this video, we will deploy the Metrics server, but you can substitute it with Prometheus. I'll show you both ways of installation using the plain YAML and Helm chart. When it's done, we will deploy a sample application and instruct the VPA controller to analyze and provide the resource recommendations. Also, I'll show you how to debug a common error that you may face with OpenSSL. In the end, I'll share my experience and explain how I used vertical pod of a scalar in production environments. All right, let's get started. Let me describe the general architecture of the components that we will need in this video. First of all, we will need a Kubernetes cluster where we deploy all our stuff. Then we will install a metrics server that will help us collect metrics for the running pods in Kubernetes by getting the data directly from the kubelets of each Kubernetes worker. It will collect data, store it locally and expose it via Kubernetes metrics API. Then we have a vertical pod of scalar VPA controller. This component will watch running pods, analyze metrics and based on the configuration can either recap recommend the resources or set the requests automatically based on usage by modifying pod spec. To configure the VPI controller to watch the pods, we will use a custom resource definition called Vertical Pod Autoscaler. Let's get started. If you already have a cluster where you wanna play with a Vertical Pod Autoscaler, you can skip it. Right now you're looking at the EKS config with a single managed instance group. Let's go to the terminal and create a Kubernetes with EKSTL. To verify that you can connect to the cluster, run kubectl get svc. If you have set up everything correctly, you should get a Kubernetes service from the default namespace. At this point, we have a fully functional EKS cluster and we can continue with the rest of the tutorial. Before deploying the metric server, let's review a couple of things. First, let's check the API. Right now, you should not have a metrics API in your cluster unless you already have a metrics server deployed. We can use grep in case we missed it. And let's filter by metrics. Also, let's run the kubectl top pods command that will eventually return the pods resource usage but right now exiting with the error metrics api not available and the last check let's try to access that api directly by using the kubectl get row command eventually it will return data when we deploy the metrics error by the way if you want to use prometheus as a source for the metrics api and use the kubectl top command that queries prometheus instead of the metrics error you can watch another video horizontal pod after scalar custom metrics and prometheus in that video I explain how to get rid of the metric server altogether. Alright, let's get started with the metric server. First we will go over all YAML files and then I'll show you how to use the Helm chart to deploy it as well. You can find the timestamps in the description. First of all, let's create a service account. Its primary goal is to provide an identity for processes that run in the pod. Then you can associate specific permissions with that service account and use them in your deployment object. Now let's create cluster roles. Those objects are part of the role-based access control, RBAC. Cluster role contains rules that represent a set of permissions and by contrast with a role is a non-namespace specific. The RBAC API declares four kinds of Kubernetes objects. Role, cluster role, role binding and cluster role binding. Now let's create a role binding and bind the service account for the metric server with an existing Kubernetes role, extension, API server, authentication reader. This allows the metric server to access the extension API server authentication config map in a cube system namespace. Then let's create a cluster role bindings to attach permissions to our service account. We also need a service. The Kubernetes metrics API will use this endpoint to redirect requests to the metric server. Vertical pod autoscaler is a Golang application that needs to be deployed to the cluster. We will use the deployment object with a service account that we created earlier. Also, let's take a look at the priority class system cluster critical. It will allow Kubernetes to give our pod high priority and evict other pods if necessary. We will use the 0.5 version. I would suggest starting with the identical versions and upgrade when deploying successfully. Also, let's set metrics resolution to 15 seconds. The last object that we need to create is the Kubernetes metrics API. It will expose metrics to the external services and redirect all the requests to the metrics service. As I mentioned before, you can substitute this service with the Prometheus. Prometheus can serve both metrics and custom metrics APIs. That's all the stuff that we need for the metrics server. Let's go ahead and apply them. Before checking anything else, let's make sure that the metrics server pod is up and running. It may take a few seconds. 
Alright, it's ready to serve metrics API. Let's use the same command and check if we got a new API. And we have it. This v1 beta 1 metrics API is ready and points to the metrics service in the kubesystem namespace. Let me run kubectl get svc to prove it. Also, we can get access to that API using the row command and we should get a JSON response. We have an object for pods and nodes. You can even get the metrics data from that API if you append the pods to the path. You get CPU and memory usage for each pod. But it's not very readable and you would prefer to use the kubectl top command. For example, let's run kubectl top pods dash n kubesystem to get CPU and memory usage for each pod in the kubesystem namespace in a readable form. Well, if you are a Helm user, there is a third-party Bitnami Helm chart that you can use to deploy metric server. Something to keep in mind that they built and use their own Docker image, but it's based on the same project. As with all Helm charts, we need to know the default variables that we can override. Let's open values.yaml file to find some parameters that we may want to change. The most important parameter here is API service. By default, it's equal to false, which means this Helm chart won't create a metrics API service. In our case, it's a hard requirement. Without metrics, the VPI controller won't be able to recommend anything. There are other parameters such as resources requests and limits that you may want to set as well. Alright, let's create a values file and set API service create to true. If you run a Helm template to generate YAML files, you will get something similar that we already have. Now let's head over to the terminal and add the Bitnami Helm chart repository. Then let's search for metric server. To deploy it, simply provide a chart release, chart name, namespace where you want to deploy, version of the Helm chart, and values that you want to override. I'm not going to deploy it using the Helm since we already deployed it with YAML. It will give you the same result. It's time to install vertical pod autoscaler in our Kubernetes cluster. To do that, first we need to clone the autoscaler GitHub project since it contains all the scripts to generate secrets and YAML files. Now let's change the directory to the the vertical pod autoscaler. And before installing, we can run the VPA process YAML command to inspect what YAML will be generated and applied. But the output of that command won't include secret information generated by package admission controllers script. To install the VPA, you would need to run the VPA app script. It will create a bunch of YAML files and apply them to the Kubernetes. Unfortunately, we got an error, a known option add X. This is a very common error, which refers to the old OpenSSL version. If you got this, you only need to update the open SSL to version 111 or higher. If you didn't get it, you could skip ahead to the next section, timestamps in the description. In this video, I'll show you how to upgrade OpenSSL on Mac properly. To get started from scratch next time when we try to install the VPA controller, let's tear down all the components using another script, VPA down. First of all, let's check the version of the OpenSSL. Based on the documentation, we should have at least 111 or higher to generate all the secrets successfully. When we run the OpenSSL version, we get something confusing. First of all, the version is higher than required, but it's totally a different name, LibreSSL. Currently, there are two independent projects, OpenSSL and LibreSSL. The last one, LibreSSL, was forked in 2004 from OpenSSL to modernize the codebase, improve security, and apply best practice development process. Those both projects are up to date, but macOS uses LibreSSL. The confusing part is that those two projects compile to the same OpenSSL binary. Now we need to install the latest version of the LibreSSL. The easiest way, and I would say the preferred way, to use Homebrew. It's a package manager similar to apt-get on Ubuntu or yum on CentOS. If you don't have installed it, just run this line from the terminal. When you have it, go to the terminal and install LibreSSL using the brew install LibreSSL command. You will need to take a note of the installation path, we will use it later, and it may be different than mine due to the version, etc. Homebrew won't create a symlink for it automatically since you already have OpenSSL on your path. If you rerun the OpenSSL version now, it will return the same old version. But if you use the installation path and run the version command, we have a new version. The last thing is to override the default OpenSSL with a new one. If you try to create a symlink to the user bin directory, it will fail even if you use sudo. Run it as a root. We can try to rename the OpenSSL to something like OpenSSL old. Even with the root permission, it will most likely fail. This is due to the fact that the new macOS operating systems have security mechanisms built in to prevent such critical modifications to your system. One of the way is to disable it, but I'll show you the proper way. Multiple paths exist out of the box on your system. For example, the original OpenSSL is located at the user bin. Another location where you can place your binaries is user local bin. It will take a 
a precedent over user bin. Now let's create a symlink to user local bin OpenSSL. Symlink or a soft link is a file that contains a reference to another file. Just a quick note, a hard link points to the file content. In contrast, the soft link points to the file name. Alright, let's execute this command. If you run OpenSSL from the same terminal, you will still get an old version. To fix that, you just need to open a new terminal. Now we have a new version. Now we can proceed with the tutorial. Let's change the directory back to the vertical pod of the scalar and run the VPA app script to deploy VPA to the Kubernetes cluster. This time we don't have any errors, which is a good indication. Let's see if all the pods are up. We have the VPA admission. It sets the correct resource requests on new pods. VPA recommender monitors the current and past resource consumption and based on it provides recommended values containing CPU and memory requests. And VPA updater checks which of the managed pods have correct resources set and if not, kill them so that they can be recreated by their controllers with the updated requests. It's time for the demo. Let's create a folder and place our deployment object there. This deployment is based on Ubuntu Slim, and the pod starts with an infinite loop that consumes approximately 300 millicores, where we define resources request only for 100 millicores. Let's see what vertical pod of the scalar thinks about it. Also, I intentionally specify large limits, which are typical when you don't know your workload and deploy it first time. You don't want Kubernetes to throttle CPU or even OM kill your app if you have low limits. The second object is a vertical pod of the scalar itself. Here you need to select a target, either deployment or stateful set, and then specify the name. Then the update policy. Here you have a couple of options. Off means it only provides recommendation without modifying the pod object. Then the default option is auto. VPA assigns resource requests on pod creation as well as updates them on existing pods using the preferred update mechanism. Currently this is equivalent to recreate. Once restart free in place update of pod request is available, it may be used as a preferred update mechanism by the auto mode. Then you have recreate. VPA assigns resource requests on pod creation as well as updates them on existing pods by evicting them with the requested resources differ significantly from the new recommendations. This mode should be used rarely, only if you need to ensure that the pods are restarted whenever the resource request changes. And initial VPA only assigns resource requests on pod creation and never changes them later. Under container policies, you need to specify the pods of the deployments. In that case, it will target all pods in the deployment object. You can specify what type of resources to analyze, CPU, memory, or both. Also, you can specify min allowed. It determines the minimal amount of resources that will be recommended for the container. And max allowed. It specifies the maximum amount of resources that will be recommended for the container. Alright, let's clean the screen and apply those objects. In the top window, we will run kubectl top pods command continuously with one second interval. Now let's create a demo app and check the pod status. If you run kubectl get vpa right now, it won't return anything since it wasn't enough time to collect metrics and provide a recommendation. We can see the demo app CPU usage in the top window, which will be around 200 and 300 millicores, and memory utilization will stay on the same level. Now let's run the kubectl pods command and leave it for at least 5 minutes. In a new tab, let's get VPA. Now we have something that we can work with. VPA controller generated a target CPU usage and memory. Memory here is in bytes, which is 250 megabytes. We know that our app doesn't use memory at all, so for this example I will ignore it and just focus on the CPU. If we describe VPA now, we can get more information. First, lower bound is a minimum recommended amount of resources. This amount is not guaranteed to be sufficient for the application to operate in a stable way. However, running with a fewer resources is likely to impact performance 
performance availability significantly. For example, we can take the CPU recommendation and use it in our requests, then target recommended amount of resources. We can take CPU from there, multiply by 2 and use it as our limit in the deployment. That's how I use this VPA controller in production environments. I only use the recommendation mode even in non-prod environments, and based on the recommendation, I can adjust the resource utilization. Personally, I wouldn't recommend using anything other than that. Since the vertical pod autoscaler cannot be used with a horizontal autoscaler, I always prefer the last one. Now let's adjust our resources and reapply. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the following video.